How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to Table Takes. My shirt is a little too green, so you're not going to see my nice Gen Con logo. Um, but I'm very excited to be here again with all of you guys. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff today. We even have a very special interview with one Tim Beach, who's going to talk about the Start Here, the introductory role-playing game. I'm very excited to talk to him today, uh, but I'm also very excited to hear what all of you have been up to in the last week. So why don't we get started? Hey, Peter, what have you been up to? Oh, well, the funnest thing I did since last year, uh, last week's table takes was playing games with Javion Smith. <laughs> Javion, uh, Javion knows he came over for game night, Friday night. And we played some space space. It was mm -hmm. really nice. Delightful I, time. I gave it. some advice that was too good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I told you all the good cards to buy and you took my advice. Yes. Around me. Thank you for the tutoring session. That You're was welcome. <laughs> and other than that, uh, you know, just uh, getting ready for Gen Con and streaming. And, um, oh, we had a little thing called a film shoot on uh, Tuesday for Actoroki. Like, I mean, in addition to the normal streaming of uh, game sessions, you know, in Actoroki, once in a while we pause, we take a beat from our RPG stories and create a film adaptation of that moment and film it. So we did that on Monday and Tuesday. And uh, Gen Con's very own Danny Kennedy was the leading character. Wow, that sounds really fun. Where can people see it? Uh, it will be, uh, well, after it gets edited, it's going to be another month or, you know, it takes time. We used to do it fast, but... but Speaking of editing films, the last film I talked about that we filmed, which is about a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, I don't know. Anyway, uh, this coming Wednesday night is going to be movie night. So this coming Wednesday night in Akroki will be movie night. We can see that film then. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be looking forward to hearing more about it later. Thank hey, you. Noir, what have you been up to this week? Not much, just you know, vibing. Also, uh, uh, the premiere of a show, uh, uh that I'm working on, uh, came out this week, which is our Star Trek show. That's all the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, clear skies. Uh, clear skies. The last Excelsior. Uh, over on Alt Haven, we're telling the story of a uh old ship that's going on its last voyage, uh, before it's decommissioned. And I'm super excited about it. It's been really fun to uh to work on. And if you want to see the intro to it, check out my TikTok. This it's is like, so cool. Yeah, this we got the really full cool. CGI and everything. It's dope. <laughs> Noir, you're bringing out my Susie Orman, okay? <laughs> now, Noir. Yes. Where the F did you get that jacket? Oh, um, this is from Hero Within. Uh, they they go to I they go to like a bunch of conventions. This is like a real nice coat jacket. Uh, it's got a liner. You can take it out. Uh, I think they might be. I think they're going to be at Gen Con too. So just be on the to look at. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, you heard it out here. If you if you go to Gen Con, you will definitely be able to find a Star Trek jacket that is as cool as Noir's. You can take his word for it. Okay. <laughs> Bonsai, what did you yes. up to? Ooh, well, this Wednesday we were doing Ektoroki for the Burning Glass Sertoff. Uh, we got to sit around and negotiate for extra gimme gimme treats, uh, which uh Peter super regretted letting us do because he was like, You only get one, maybe you can get two, but everybody got two, and then he was like, Hold on. Hold on, hold on. I'm being very generous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we got uh, a lot of really cool traits for that. Uh, and some really good, like for our characters and our background stories, uh, some good renown. I am known for pump punching dwarves, <laughs> which is actually a good thing in this game. Okay. I'm good. We made friends because I punched them in the face. Uh, and if you guys want more details about that, you should just watch our pods that are, you know, on YouTube or in the links below, just saying, you know. Yeah, also awesome. that uh I did a very girl thing since Gen Con soon. I got my nails done. Look at I got little talents Ooh. now. Ooh. Uh so yeah, instead of or I know surprisingly it's not orange. Uh <laughs> it's teal. But I figured if I'm using a lot of orange in my clothing anyways, I'll just use a nice complementary color to balance it out. But other than that, what about you? Of course, other than uh, getting your booty handed to you by Peter on Friday. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's a great question, Bonsai. Um, well, I've been surviving the heat. It's getting pretty hot here in Seattle. Um, you know, I teach uh, a lot of rock climbing and I'm getting injuries all the time. So I'm like trying to keep safe. Uh, I'm heading down to Portland today, so as soon as the stream ends, I'm going to hop in a car with my buddy, and we're going to drive down. Um, oh, and I've been playing way too much on Board Game Arena. I have like nine games going at once right now. Um, it's actually blinking on my screen to try to get me to play it some more right now. I started playing Micro Dojo. It's actually a really fun game. It's pretty simple. I was I was surprised. It took me a second to like actually like, read through the rules because I hate reading. But you're just like, you know, moving tokens around on a three by three grid. And then you need to collect money or food. And then you try to get points. It's in, it's simple. I like it. I play it a little bit too much. So um, if you don't see me next week, just, you know, check Board Game Arena. See if I'm online there. That's how you know I'm okay. Wow. Um, we have a lot of really cool headlines to get into. So let's just dive right in. This first headline, Peter's going to bring it to us. It's a little bit of news thanks to our own Alex Meehan. Tell us more, Peter. Well, Alex Meehan is our Gen Con... Oh, you mean with the article. Uh, yeah. I just like talking about Alex Meehan being our staff writer, Gen Con TV news writer. Uh, so yes, this is the second article that we've gotten from Alex. And we did talk about the Spiel des Jahres um, awards a, a little bit, but this article goes into more depth because we have more information now. So yes, okay, from Alex Meehan, the nominees for the Spiel des Jahres 2024, the biggest award in board gaming, have finally been revealed. The Spiel des Jahres, um, which roughly translates to Game of the Year in English, is the most prestigious award in the board gaming industry. Traditionally awarded during the Essen Spiel Convention, the largest tabletop convention in, well, <clears throat> um, I might beg to differ. I guess it depends on how you measure it, uh, which takes place in the German city of Essen every year. Uh, is voted on by a variety of board game critics, writers, and enthusiasts. Uh, previous winners include the likes of word guessing games like Code Names, Betting Game, Camel Up, Storytelling Game, Dixit, and Train Hopping Game Ticket to Ride. The award is typically geared toward family-friendly board games that sit somewhere in the middle of complexity and difficulty, though it can depend on that on the particular offering of titles released that year. This year's nominees for Spiel de Yaris 2024 are in the footsteps of Darwin, which was co-designed by Gregory Grard and Matthew Verdier and published by the studio Sorry, We Are French. <laughs> the title is inspired by the works of famed natural scientist Charles Darwin, whose voyages around the world led to the creation of one of the most important scientific journals ever written on the origins of species. The board game, In the Footsteps of Darwin, has players becoming eager and ambitious junior naturalists who have been assigned with assisting Mr. Darwin on his research aboard the iconic Beagle, the ship that took the legendary journey to the Galapagos Islands. As his assistants, players will need to carry out a variety of tasks such as studying the local wildlife, creating cartography, and developing theories, all in the name of contributing to the eponymous origin of species. On the other end of the complexity scale is Captain Flip, a board game co-created by Remo Canzadori and Paolo Mori which has been also been nominated for the Spiel de Yaris 2024. Published by PlayPunk, Captain Flip is a simple board game in which players are managing their very own crew of pirates. As pirate captains, players will need to do uh, scurvy knaves, do as scurvy knaves do, and sail the seas in search of sweet, sweet gold. In order to do this, players will need to rummage in a bag of booty before randomly drawing a tile. <laughs> Should players draw a tile they like, then they keep it as part of their stash. If they draw a dud, then they flip the tile to turn it into a crewmate hmm. before placing it somewhere on their ship. Captain Flip is designed to be quick and easy to play and proves how varied the Spiel de Yaris nominees can be. The last nominee for the Spiel de Yaris 2024 award is Sky Team, a title designed by Luc Raymond and released by Scorpion Mask. Sky Team is a two-player game that <clears throat> challenges people to put themselves in the pilot and co-pilot seat of a plane that's about to land. The only co-op board game out of the nominees, Sky Team has players working together to push the right buttons and pull the correct levers to bring their incoming plane to a safe landing. 
Sky Team has already received the accolade of Best Board Game by Dice Breakers Tabletop Gaming Awards with the Adrenaline Field title, providing players with an engaging gameplay system that tests their communication skills and judgment whilst under pressure. <clears throat> there are a selection of different landing scenarios for players to choose from, which collectively uh, form a full campaign to play through. Um, yeah, the winner of the categories will be announced during the year's Essen Spiel Convention, which will take place between October 3rd and 6th. And if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get some water. Back to you, Banzai. <laughs> well, uh, I have to say, I am most looking forward to seeing Sky Team win, because I know it's going to. Um, Peter, uh, and I'm sure everybody else is trying to sell the, the Captain Flip game just because it's got the word booty in it. I get it. Yeah, funny word, haha. But, I mean, we've seen co-op games win Spiel des Jahres before. I mean, we've seen Just One, we've seen Hanabi, right? Even Dorf Romantic won last year. So, um, maybe another co-op game can win this year. We'll I, see. I'm with you, Javion. I'm, I'm with you. Sky Team, that's got my vote. Yes. If they if they ask me to vote, I'm that's where I'm going to vote. But I feel I don't like that's know. the favorite favorite child in the group, yeah. though. Yeah, in this group, definitely. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, uh, let's look forward to seeing who actually wins the Spiel des Jahres. And one more quick pat on the back for Peter for those great pronunciations. Well done. <laughs> Let's move on to something a little bit easier to pronounce. Noir, why don't you take it away? Yes. So, Wizards of the Coast appoints World of Warcraft veteran John Height as president. Um, uh, so, Height will oversee both Dungeons and & Dragons and Magic the Gathering, along with the company's digital gaming branch, which is responsible for converting the aforementioned properties into video games. The Tabletop Behemoth announced the hire on July 18th, just over three months after the previous president, Cynthia Williams, tenured her resignation and joined pop culture plastic ex uh, extruder Funko as CEO. Height is a lifelong video games guy, starting his career at the 3DO company, I remember 3DO, uh, and Electronic Arts in the 1990s, and then, uh, then Atari in the 2000s, before joining Blizzard as an executive producer of World of Warcraft in 2011. A decade later, Height took over the reins of the entire World of Warcraft franchise as general manager while also overseeing developments in Diablo 3 and its Reaper of Souls expansion, Hearthstone, and WoW's classic servers. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I, 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 they're clearly leaning towards the video game aspect of things from the looks of it, and I just hope that they don't forget where they came from. Like, we don't forget the pen and papers just because digital's <laughs> kind of cool. But, I mean, he worked on some really really amazing stuff uh diablo 3 and hearthstone in particular uh what do you all think about this hire i just remember that article when it came out about how cynthia williams just like dropped so suddenly um looks like they found somebody to replace them uh they definitely needed to work really quickly so i hope it wasn't too rushed yeah, I don't know, uh, Mr. Height. I, I certainly wish him the best. Uh, if I met him, I would say just never forget you've got the two best games ever designed in the history of the world. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and move on to another titan of gaming. Let's talk about Ravensburger and Disney Lorcana. Now, uh, you guys know I have been recently... Uh, recruited onto the fan page and the fan community of Lorcana. So I, much like many others, was very excited to hear <laughs> that Robinsberger has unveiled the Lorcana D23 collection set. Now this article comes to us from Jeffrey Dome Sanchez of ICV2, and it's all about the six new collectible cards you can grab only at the Disney Lorcana D23 Expo, which is going to be happening on the weekend of August 9th this year, which happens to be the week after Gen Con and the same week that Set 5 releases. Now, all the cards included are as follows. We've got the another Mickey Mouse, a Cinderella, an Ursula, Bruno, Madrigal, uh, Vanellope Von Sweets, if you remember from... Uh, uh, Wreck-It Ralph. Thank you, Wreck-It Ralph. Thank you. Uh, and uh, 
actually, there's also a very special one from a set that's not out yet, set six. This one is Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, uh, a sort of a throwback to the early days of Disney, excuse me. Um, so that preview card from the set from that's supposed to be releasing in November um, is going to retail for $99.99. This whole box set actually is pretty wild. So all of these cards, they have alternate art um, and they are all very, very shiny. They're definitely going to only appreciate in value. Each of the cards features a, well, yeah, each card in the set features a card from a different set. So we've got the first chapter, the first edition of Disney Lorcana, and every set afterwards leading all the way up to the currently unannounced name of the sixth set. So it's pretty cool to see all of this stuff. Um, I'm really sad that I'm definitely not going to be able to get my hands on one, but I'm sure I will see one on eBay not too long, um, shortly or long after uh, the actual set is released at the convention. So early congratulations to all the fun people that get to go to uh, the convention and get their hands on one. Uh, I I will happily scan the internet and looking to see who actually got their hands on them and hopefully they're in um, nice shape once you have to travel with them from california all righty well there we go some fun disney loricana news let's move into something a little bit less well known here bonsai why don't you tell us more all right. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of this uh, RPG that came out a couple of years ago called Wild Sea, which, if you aren't familiar, is about this vast, vast world with an endless jungle that's so, so dense that the only way to travel it uh, through it is by chainsaw ships. Uh, while you go ahead and explore the world, this is an example of the chainsaw ships. Really, really cool. Uh, well, uh, of course... It uh, Wild Sea was had a lot of praise for a uh, praise and awards outside, of course, its beautiful artwork and awesome setting. It also uh, attracted a lot of praises for its rules. Um, at a high level, the rules are reminiscent and inspired by Blades in the Dark, but there's a touch of more mechanics to it. Um, weight to them. Basically, if you like Forge in the Dark uh, systems, but didn't care for the emphasis on playbooks uh, that they do and have um. Excuse me. Actually, like having uh actual like really crunchy, crunchy mechanics to play with. The Wild Sea solved that for you. Um, for now, those rules are now available on SRD form and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution uh 4.0. Basically, you can use them uh for free and without restriction, so long as you include a small attri attribution near your copyright text. Uh, so basically, if you want, if you like their rules and you wanted to play and make your own set. They released it on uh, Creative Commons, and they also relieved a non-commercial license to allow folks to publish fan material for the Wild Sea itself. So if you are a really big fan of the setting or the world itself, uh, they're like, hey, I give this to Create. Uh, and I always like that when creators, especially when they're very popular for the game mechanics, go goes ahead and says, I release you to grow. Um, yeah, there you go. But yeah, and I... Oh, sorry. I Fair was going to say, I no, I would be very excited to see uh, some really, really awesome play or RPGs or Tater Pigs uh, based off of this in like two or three years. I was just going to say, this seems like a really cool setting. I've been jumping into a bunch of different RPGs lately. I always love seeing some stuff that maybe is like past my radar. So, wow. Um, it looks like uh, we have a lot of really cool stuff to look forward to. Noir, why don't you tell us about another one? As soon as I find the mute button. So we've got <laughs> into the vault of many things. Uh, Tinker House Games will release Vault of Many Things, a new standalone uh, a standalone and terrain set into retail on December 6, 2024. This set allows players to add an array of diverse creatures, heroes, and monsters to their games of D&D &D and Pathfinder and other tabletop RPGs. <clears throat> it comes with over 800 acrylic standee miniatures that come detailed and in full color. The set also includes 72 reversible terrain art inserts on bases, as well as three trays of terrain starters, which include walls, map tiles, and props to 
Uh, and to organize this box, the Vault Box integrates a sleeve organization system into this product that is color coded to make setup faster. I really wish they had stuff like this for modern game, like modern setting games. But you know, yeah, yeah, whatever. Do you need to have more stuff? I'm, I'm not mad. But check it out if you, uh, check it out if you want a really easy, quick way to set up maps, uh, for your games. This is really cool. What do you guys think? I like the convenience that it is. <laughs> All the the stuff in one box. Give me more stuff in boxes. I guess I should be like that. That's my. Uh, but at well, the same time. I get it. And then I'm like, ooh, maybe I don't want to use all the things. This is a trap. It's like, oh, I got these things, but do I need all these things? I don't know. <laughs> I just think all those you know, 800 million, I think they'd look great on my shelf down in the studio. You know, I, I got more shelf space. So yeah, <laughs> more, yeah. It's cool to see this as being uh, released direct to retail. This is definitely the kind of thing I would have expected it to be like a Kickstarter. I mean, we see all the different like accessories and supplements and all that <clears throat> stuff being crowdfunded but this seems like you know you'll see it actually in the store you can actually pick up and look at it first that's awesome yeah i really dig just being able to start having maps just right out the box easy to go yeah it's real nice speaking of rpgs let's keep the ball rolling peter won't you tell us some more about some D, &D dice Yes, uh, this feature is brought to us by William Needling at ICV2. Beetle and Grimm's is launching the Classic Module Dice Collection. This is a series of role-playing accessories inspired by iconic Dungeons & Dragons adventure modules to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the game. The first six sets will be available in October. A limited number of collector sets with all six will also be available. Each set in a series is packaged in a deluxe felt line hinged box decorated with a cover art from a classic D&D module. Inside the box is a complete series of, of the seven resin polyhedral dice and familiar shapes that you've all come to know and love. Also included are four collector cards with artwork from the module and details about the module's history and legacy within the hobby and a two inch diameter collectible metal coin. The first six classic module dice collection sets will be, drum roll please, Tomb of Horrors, White Plume Mountain, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, Ravenloft, The Temple of Elemental Evil, and Vecna Lives. I want to, I, I, I want to get them. <laughs> awesome. Wow. These look pretty cool. Um, I've actually played White Plume Mountain myself. I really love that <clears throat> adventure. Could not recommend it enough. I really wish this these dice had come out for it because I could like surprise all my players and be like, ooh, look at it. But I played the I more know. modern, sort of revamped edition for 5e, so maybe it's a little different. I gotta admit, I've been really tempted to like um I mean I'm stepping back from DMing more complicated things. I've I've been feeling like maybe maybe I'd like to run some old AD and D modules. That'd be fun. Like mm -hmm. run two horrors or something. Oh uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. It sounds it does sound fun. Yeah, I, I especially love the box that these all come in because it comes with also the original artwork and everything like that. Um, I think, well, there is one thing you were saying that it technically, Peter is mentioning in the background that Vecna isn't really that old and should it actually be included? It was I, I know, it was 1990. I mean, that's that's not old, is it? Uh, maybe it is. <laughs> I can tell you why Vecna lives because Paladins can only smite once for Okay, that's it. I just had to get that out. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank I you. I used to think that is endearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, um, if you got a spare forty-five dollars laying around and you want some cool stuff to surprise your players with, definitely check this out when it gets launched into retail. All right, now for something completely different. Let's talk about a little company called Exploding Kittens. Uh, they are definitely in the zeitgeist recently because of their TV show, but actually their company just announced their summer lineup of four new games, uh, some of which I'm actually very excited about. So let's talk about them. The first one coming up is going to, like all of these games, is going to be released in summer this year. 
I, I mean, it's already summer, so check your check your stores now to make sure. Okay, so the first one we have is let's hit each other with fake swords. So in this game, you have cards and you're going to try to collect them by playing them and hoping nobody else plays the same card as you. If anybody does vie for the same thing you're looking for, you can duel over it with these fake swords that they give you in the very big box. Now, the game is actually for three to six players, but as I'm told, you can only battle one other person at a time. So they're very there are duels between two players, but you'll have strange and you know different requirements on how you're allowed to actually play the game. Nothing below the belt. Okay, let's take a look at this next one called Zombie Burrito. Now this one is actually the, in addition to the Throw Throw Burrito franchise. And it's got a new theme. It's zombies and survivors. So you can actually split into different teams and chuck burritos at each other. I'm assuming the burritos are full of brains. Otherwise, why would zombies want burritos? I don't know. <laughs> so this one is also for three to six players, and it looks like it's only going to play about 15 minutes. So all of these are very <clears throat> short-ish games. All right, next up, we've got When Sip Hits the Fan. This is a drinking game. You're going to spin a spinner, and you're going to have different challenges, either sipping or actually having to like collect cards and try to maintain the different challenges. So you might have to like give somebody your phone and let them, you know, scroll through the camera roll, or you might have to like keep your finger on your nose. I don't know. There's a lot of different things. So we'll have to wait until well, two days and check Target and Amazon. It's only going to retail for $15. So it's a, it's a little bit more lightweight. And the next one we have here is called You Little Stinker. It's all about a stinky dog and having a sinking good time. It's a kid's game. It's all about matching pictures. You're going to roll some dog-shaped dice. Sorry, you're going to roll dice in a dog-shaped dice shaker. You roll the dice and you try to match the dice to the picture cards. Very simple, very fun. Great for all the kids who like stinky dogs, I guess. Uh, it's only a five-minute game, so it's definitely a quick one. And it's only going to retail for $20. Looks like all of these games are going to release in two days. So definitely check out Amazon and Target if you want to get your hands on them early. All right. We're going to just barrel ahead here into our final article. And Bonsai, why don't you tell us what it is? Of course. Well... I don't know if you guys are a fan of the Stormlight uh, series by Brandon uh, Sanderson, but there has been talk over a long period of time that, uh, you know, they have a Kickstarter for a Stormlight Archives RPG that is coming out. It has over 21,000 followers on their Kickstarter, uh, a highly anticipated RPG um, that actually any details really have come out but guess what boom they just released this week brotherwise games has finally released some details in the form of a preview of a game of previews of the game's combat actions so i go ahead and put that in the link uh in chat if you wanted to go ahead and see that so uh what you can see there it looks like the game has taken more inspirations from shadow of the demon lord uh with players having a choice between either taking a slow action or fast uh or slow initiative or fast initiative slow initiatives will always act after fast initiatives but they gain more action so instead of fast initiatives that only hit two actions they get three actions uh, in addition of some showing some of the basic RPG actions uh, like movement and attacking, the preview also hints at a lot about Stormlight Archives uh, spe uh, specific stuff like they used uh, Stormlight abilities and Sprint. Uh, the preview also includes a reference for some more other elements like focus, meta currency, and the use of plot die. Uh, this kind of feels similar if you ever played any Fantasy Flight uh, Genesis Star Wars system games. You'd be very interested. Me, myself, I'm kind of worried about custom dice to play games because if you are a fan of the Star Wars RPG, you know there's a certain point you couldn't get the dice and you needed the dice and everybody wanted to play the game. So that's just my coin of worry about what has been released so far but it does look really really cool a lot of people were saying that it looked more like pathfinder uh two kind of um kind of playthrough like kind of system but i feel like it has a little bit different flavor more akin to shadow of the demon lord and the fantasy flight uh star wars system so 
we'll have to keep an ear out more as more details come along. Like I said, this is just a taste, so we probably won't have too much of a discussion about it. This seems like it's a huge Kickstarter. I actually have seen like a lot of comments and people talking about how excited they are for this to finally get released so they can actually get their hands on it. It's cool to see a sneak <clears throat> preview, uh, you know, just making sure everybody out there stays as hyped as possible. So thank you, Bonsai. Well, that is going to do it for all of our headlines today. So let's roll right in to Crowdfunder Court. Welcome to Crowd Thunder Court. Here come the judges. Prepare to be judged. All right, court is now in session. All rise for the Honorable Dragon Fafnir. My first Kickstarter here is all about the flames of Fafnir. I have been waiting for this Kickstarter to come out ever since I got a little advertisement on my Facebook over a month ago. And I've just been waiting with bated breath until we could finally see it in action. The Flames of Fafnir is sort of competitive, sort of cooperative, but it is a tower defense game all about a giant dragon that shoots fireballs. It's a little bit of a physical, almost dexterity game in that you're rolling marbles <clears throat> through Fafnir's mouth and out onto the board, crashing into all the different players, into the barricades and walls, and eventually ransacking all of the different towns and collecting loot. You're trying to defeat Fafnir by figuring out all the different runes that it's got and using them against Fafnir before you get bapped all the way to the back of the field. In the tower defense style, you're building barricades and walls. And if you do a really good job, you'll get more points. But there are two things that make this game very unique. Number one, there's a trader mechanic. You can decide to side with Fafnir if you get enough points and you decide to swap to the other team. That In that case, maybe nobody wins. Everybody will get slain by the dragon and you'll just have to play again. Another thing is that this is semi-cooperative. Again, if everybody loses, nobody wins. So you have to sort of work together to hope that Fafnir doesn't do too much damage to the town while also trying to be the one who gets all the glory. So it's a very interesting and very fun game. There are a whole lot of demos and gameplay videos you can check out on the Kickstarter. It plays about 90 minutes. So you're not just going to roll the marble down a couple of times and then, you know, call it a night. You're actually going to have a lot of strategy. It's a lot of area control and placement. The components are fascinating. You could go for the basic edition. It's only $87 in US dollars. Or you could bump yourself up like I did for the collector pledge for $174, where you get not only two expansions, but upgraded components and all of the stretch goals that they have with it. The most important of which, if you ask me, is instead of having a little cardboard dragon, you get this giant plastic miniature, which really makes you feel like there's a dragon in your home shooting fireballs. So I'm very excited for this. I love anything gimmicky like this. I got Fireball Island as soon as it um as I found out that it was a thing. So it's got 11 days left on the Kickstarter, and they've already gone far past their goal, almost tripling it with $86,000 so far. So let's get a few more stretch goals. Definitely check out the link in Twitch chat there if you also want to sign up. Let's go for our next crowdfunder here. Hey, Noir, tell us what it is. It's Hunter slash Hunted or Hunter Aid. <laughs> Sorry, that was a dub joke. So Hunter slash Hunted is a fast-paced narrative a uh, narrative heavy game that is played with a standard deck of cards or a pair of d6s one player will be playing the hunter uh which is the pursuer who's driven and steadfast in their quest to track and slay their quarry while the other is playing the monster who is the pursued alienated feared and hated among those who've crossed their path and they're determined to survive by any means necessary 
After creating characters, the hunt begins with both players rolling dice, aiming to roll doubles as quickly as possible before the other player does. When someone has rolled doubles, players stop rolling as the player who... Uh, who wrote the doubles advances the token one step closer to the opposing player and one step closer to finishing their hunt. A prompt is then drawn and the players answer it through role play, playing out events of the hunt, memories of the characters, and the innermost thoughts of both Hunter and Hunted. This game was created by Megan Cross and Super Dylan, friend of the show. Uh, and right now they have a goal of $2,500 and they have destroyed it uh, at $4,615 with 25 days to go. This is a fun, fast-paced, easy, and accessible game, and I highly recommend that you look into it check it out and back them uh the designers of this don't miss you will have a blast i assure you sounds awesome thank you thank you noir okay peter why don't you take it away for our final kickstarter okay this is the anywhere door and it is a community hub for monty cook games it is currently being funded on backer kit it has raised fifteen thousand six hundred dollars versus a goal of fifteen thousand dollars Imagine a place where you can find a plethora of great Monty Cook games, video content, streams, unboxings, reviews, interviews, con activities, and more. Now, imagine a vibrant, friendly, well-moderated chat community. Put it all together in a single place with an elegant, welcoming user interface, and you have the Anywhere Door, an environment for interacting with Monty Cook games fans and finding and sharing inspiration to take your games to exciting new places. Why is it called the Anywhere Door? Because it's like that cipher, except it doesn't close. Once we open the Anywhere Door, you can step through anytime you like. It's a new official community hub from Montecook Games on the Moonbeam platform, and we want to create it with you and for you. The Anywhere Door, supported by and in partnership with the fantastic folk who run the Cypher Unlimited Discord, will launch this fall. It will open be open to all, but founders, including you, we hope, will have early access to exclusive Founders Badge and, depending on your pledge level, other rewards. More importantly, your backing will help us launch with an incredible slate of new content with loads of great support for the Cypher system and all of Monty Cook games game lines the anywhere door is built on moonbeam a new platform that combines multi-channel video streaming with robust chat community features we love it because it draws disparate community elements into one rich environment with really robust moderation features that make it a pleasure to maintain community standards streamers will love it because it helps them reach larger audiences and has superior revenue generating and sharing features You'll love it because it gives you a multimedia company, a community experience in a pleasant, easy to use environment. Funding will support paid moderation, $2,500 for grants to new streamers, $2,500 for grants to established streamers, resources for streamers, CypherCon support, and new content from Monty Cook Games, including a streamed show, Game Night with Monty Cook Games. As a streamer myself, I have to say I am very happy to see Dante Cook is trying to get something up and running. And also, if you're out there listening, I'm sure that each and every one of us would love to collaborate with you guys. So definitely check out the link in Twitch chat if you want to go help them support what they're trying to do. This looks really cool. Thank you so much, Peter, for bringing this up for us. Looks like we have a couple of minutes here. So I have a quick question for you guys real fast. What are you looking forward to for Gen Con this year? We have a lot of different things. There's a lot of Kickstarters, actually, that I'm hoping to see there. Um, so what, what about you guys? What are you looking forward to? Uh, uh, I'm looking for the uh, the series of panels that uh, we organized on the history of Dungeons & Dragons with all sorts of people who were big in, in the history, like Jonathan Tweet and Zeb mm -hmm. Cook and uh, so on and so forth. I'm just really excited to, one, meet some friends that I haven't seen in a long time and play some games. Uh, and just getting to see what games are out there uh, that everyone, like, get my hands on some actual playthroughs before I'm like, all right, all right, I'll back this because... 
because I want to preview it personally first. Uh, I'm I'm doing a couple of panels. I'm doing one with uh Hero uh, Hero Forge. Uh, I did it last Ooh. year. It was super fun, and I can't wait to do it again. It's gonna be a good time. Okay, well, I'll tell you guys what I'm excited for. I mean, I've already told you, and I'm definitely gonna tell you again. We'll have to wait till next week because our interviewee is here. Let's go ahead and bring in our interviewer. Sorry, our interviewee for interview worthy. Beach. Hello, Tim. It's good to see you. Hi, y'all. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about all of you? Great. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome to the Table yeah. Takes. I haven't Thank seen you in a long time. We have a <laughs> lot of questions for you. <laughs> I'm here, with, here we are at Bonsai, Noir, and Javion. I uh, don't know if you've ever met them, but they're all excited to meet. I, I've been giving great reviews, telling everybody what a nice guy you are. And um, uh, well, thank you. It's good to see you see you here. So why don't you start by telling us what you're up to? Well, I have an introductory role-playing game that uh, we've just published and received copies of. Uh, we did a Kickstarter last year and uh, some more work this year to get it finished and uh, just received copies. So that that's it. It's called Start Here, the introductory role-playing game. And I can show you a copy. Oh! <laughs> Oh, that's nice. cool. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, I am super pleased with it. Uh, um, we used a, a, a U.S. printer, and uh, they were very good to work with, and uh, got everything to us just uh, recently. Uh, the box cover artwork is by Todd Lockwood, um, oh, which yes. we were very pleased to get. And then inside the box, we have uh, three books. It's an introductory game, so it's meant both for beginners, complete beginners, and for experienced players who want to teach beginners. So we have book one, the beginner's book, with a cover art by Rob Carlos, who is local to Tacoma. And book two, for experienced players, I kind of think of this as the teacher's edition, and that's also artwork by Rob Carlos. Uh, this particular one, he started sketching while we were talking about the game over coffee, and within a couple of weeks, he had almost everything finished. And then uh, book three is a campaign sampler with four sample campaigns, um, the cover art by Larry Elmore. Oh, wow. Well, you got some famous artists there for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, did, I'm remembering uh, how much uh, Todd Lock Lockwood loves to draw dragons. Yes, he does. Uh, and that was why we wanted him to get him uh, for one of them. And then uh, uh, for the old school feel, um, I'm I'm glad we were able to bring in Larry Elmore on that as well. Uh, I had a question for you, if you don't mind ask, or sure. answering. Uh, for the introduction role-playing game, you said for beginners, is there like an age range for beginner beginners like that you're thinking of? We suggest eight years old, uh, but it's really, it depends on the focus. Um, I've played with kids as young as five who had amazing focus <clears throat> and, you know, adults who did not. So it's kind of a matter of whatever works for your game. <laughs> when you started out on this, did you start out with the intention to make a uh, game that's good for beginners? Or did you just start making a game and realize, oh, this would be a great introductory uh, system? I had a thing I was running and, uh, and I realized that I needed to adjust it uh, downward uh, to a uh, beginner level. Um, I was running a Lego game, game with Lego minifigs, because I use Legos whenever I can, because why wouldn't I? And I was running a Lego game at a friend's house every year. And uh, one year before we were going to play, one of my regulars um, called up and said, hey, I want to bring my parents. They've never played a role-playing game before. And I was typing up characters at the time and uh, literally typing something like sixth level ranger. And I thought, man, they have no idea what any bit of that means. And so I started thinking of it in terms of functionality and how I could relate this to somebody who doesn't have a clue. 
and uh, how we could teach it quicker and uh, and things like that. And there were a couple of other incidents. Um, my now ex-wife uh, on a road trip, she was playing in a third edition game I was running. And, uh, and she said, okay, explain Dungeons and Dragons to me. Um, and she was working for the governor's office at the time and didn't really have a lot of... Uh, she was very smart, but uh, didn't have a lot left over after she was working there. And so explain Dungeons and Dragons to me so she could participate better. And as I was doing it, I ran into what I considered redundancies or arbitrary decisions that I thought could be made a little easier. Like, why is an armor class here and a reflex is saved there? Well, because that's the way it is. And, and <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, and then a third incident, uh, in the early 90s, uh, Mike Selinker and I wrote a live action role playing game. Uh, very simple rules that we used at uh, Gen Con to do these big events. Um, and when third edition came out, he said, you should write live action rules for third edition. And I thought that is impossible. <laughs> I mean, I love third edition. Um, I love the complexity of it, but it was too much for a live action game. And so between those three incidents, it's got me thinking about simplifying and making it more approachable. And, and so that's what I did. And I uh, took the step of actually simplifying the D and D D twenty system and uh, making it easy so that I can teach it now in five minutes. I I gotta say I I can't agree more. I think for the first five years that I even learned what D and D was, I had no idea what the difference between like a ranger and a druid was. I'm I'm wondering what is the play like for start here. Well, I I tried to make it. Um, when uh, simplifying the rules, I tried to make it more story-based, uh, too. So there is one basic rule, uh, like most role-playing games and like D&D and other similar games, you have ability scores, the six standard D&D ones, uh, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. When you take an action, you make an action roll. You roll a 20-sided die. You add the ability score that matches the action. The number you're trying to beat is the other side's target number, which is usually 10 plus their ability score. And that is 90% of the game right there. So, Yeah, so you use the standard array of dice for this? Uh, just a d20. Oh, just the d20. So you don't have to all complicated d6s, d10s. Yep. Oh, no, the dice collectors are going to be very bad about this. <laughs> yeah, well, we do have some very cool custom d20s, though, from a Foam Brain game. They made us some metal d20s that are just awesome. Uh, they took very good care of us. And so, uh, yeah. So if, if, if you uh, attack, then you and you roll. If if you hit, you kill. There's no. Is there any? Is there hit points? Uh, no hit points. Um, so if you attack, all attacks are made with dexterity because it's hand-eye coordination, or in the case of certain monsters, maybe tentacle-eye coordination. And if you hit, then the other side tries to resist your damage, and they do that by rolling a strength roll. And if they succeed on the strength roll, they take no damage. If they fail the strength roll, they take damage. It comes off of their strength. They lose a point of strength because as we fight, we get worn out. You get to zero strength, and then it's up to the other side to decide what to do with you. I kind of thought that uh, while I was making some changes, that I would take the approach that <clears throat> you might have to think about killing the opponent. You know? <laughs> hmm. So is the okay. target number the other character's dexterity? Yes. Yep, dex plus 10 is the target number for an attack. Dex pl uh, plus 10, sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the mm. average that they would unroll would have. So a if you have a you have a uh fifty five percent chance of hitting somebody with the same dexterity as you. Correct, yes. That's yep. awesome. I'm imagining like what that is like at the table. And that fits very closely to what I thought D D was like before I saw how many different kinds of dice there are. So that's really cool. I like that. What were you gonna say, Nora? Thank you. I sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, please. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I just wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, and part of that uh, ended up being taking away choice. Um, so that uh, you have uh, four basic archetypes in start here, the warrior, the rogue, the mage, and the believer. Uh, in the experienced player's book, there are four more. But anything that you want to play beyond that comes down to maybe how you want to play. Like, if you want to be a paladin, 
well, a warrior might be what you play or a believer might be what you play, but a paladin is how you play it. Oh, so it's I a see. style. And what do you think of that, Noir? <laughs> Sorry, I, I just got thrown for a loop. Um, so my next question was, uh, it, the, the title start here kind of implies that it, it, that this is going to, uh, you know, train you to uh, play other games. Do, the, do you intend to add more complex uh, rule sets as as people uh, continue on to this series? Or, you know, is this is this where, you know, they could start and kind of stay? Uh, yes to both. Uh, okay. They can... <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I don't intend to add more complex rules to the basic of start here. Um, in fact, uh, I've seen TSR and then Wizards of the Coast and Paizo um, build these rule set and keep adding and adding and adding until there's just such saturation that nobody can know everything and then burn it to the ground and start over, uh, which is a legitimate business practice, but it's not for me. <laughs> It is my hope to never, ever put out a second edition of my rules. Uh, what I want to do is campaign material for the rest of my life. That's, uh, awesome. that's my ideal. And so what I envision and, and hope to do is uh, each setting might have a few extra rules, like in uh, uh, the Zombie Saurus Rex setting, which is one of the four in the campaign sampler, um, there are rules for how the... the uh, propagation of the zombie virus works and how you fight zombies with music and things like that. <laughs> so, uh, but other than that, I don't really want to add rules to the system. What I do want to add and what I envision is adding crosswalks, which is if you want to play 5e, then you adjust the rules this way. And you would start by maybe adding hit points and armor class. And then you would talk about skills and feats. And then you would talk about, you know, other things. Um, and each level you kind of, it, again, it would be a teaching product that would uh, step from my game to another complicated game. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I have a question, uh, you know, Tim, we jumped right into what you're doing here. Um, yes. Maybe you could share with our audience and our co-panelists here just a little bit of your history in the gaming industry, because you've been at this for quite a while. I have uh, for a bit over 30 years, which doesn't even seem real to me, uh, but, uh, but yes, I've been doing it for a while. And uh, I worked for TSR in the 90s. If you played second edition D&D or AD&D, as we called it at the time, or you know anything of that era, you almost certainly used something I worked on. Um, I put together the Monstrous Manual for second edition. I did the Thrykreen book for Dark Sun, Factal's Manifesto for Planescape, uh, City of the Lights for Al-Kadim, and any number of uh, Forgotten Realms projects, including uh, Pages from the Mages, which I did with Ed Greenwood, and uh, uh, and about you know five or six dozen other products. <laughs> so, um, and then after that, uh, I was I, I was actually the first TSR game designer hired by Wizards of the Coast, and the first one laid off. Um, in the very first round of Wizards of the Coast layoffs, which I have forgiven Peter for. <laughs> and again, understanding that there are business contingencies and things happen. I haven't forgiven uh, myself it's, if it's any comfort. I... Well, you know, it, stuff happens and 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 I have forgiven you. Um, in fact, I, I don't think I ever really held it against you. Thank you. Uh, but um, uh, I've also worked on Deadlands. Uh, I did the Rascals, Varmints, and Critters uh, development for them, one of their uh, core books back in the day. And they now credit me with, uh, in the newest edition of Deadlands, they credit me with uh, the mechanism by which uh, adventurers get their adventures. Um, and I did some work with uh, Ulysses Spiel on the English version of uh, Das Schwarze Auge, uh, The Dark Eye. So. Very, very cool. Sounds like you definitely have been around for a while. Um, I'm wondering, how can people get their hands on Start Here? Are you planning on making it uh, something in, that goes to retail? Or is it going to be probably in like local game stores? Yes, it is uh, scheduled for um, about 25 local game stores around the nation. Uh, we've already delivered copies to uh, Olympic Cards and Comics in uh, Lacey Olympia, uh, Gabby's, as it's uh, known. 
um, which is a great store, and uh, to um, the game shelf in Kent. Um, I'll make a couple more deliveries today, and uh, we're mailing out uh, numerous others. Uh, but uh, part of that was uh, when we were selling the retail package was the promise that I would do in-store games either in person or via Zoom. So we've got to get those arranged, but uh, yeah, I'll be making appearances either virtually or in person at game stores around the nation. Um, in addition, we'll do, we have distribution through um, two people, two players, uh, Continuum and Bridge, and we'll hope to expand that and uh, we'll do sales in person as well. Ah, okay. So it's not just going to be in Washington, but it sounds like that's a good place to go if you want, but around the nation as well. Okay. Yes, Got correct. It. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for coming on with us. We loved having you. I can't wait to see what you do next because this is really awesome. Well, uh, and please you. stick around for just a little bit while we get signed off here. And for okay. that, I'm going to throw it on over to Peter. All right. All right. Well, this concludes another amazing episode of Table Takes. Thank you for joining us today. But don't go far because it's just a couple hours and we will have Sarah's Table where Sarah takes the Pantheon to the depths of the God of Death's domain and will encounter the most dangerous enemy yet, a treadmill. <laughs> That's today at 5 p.m. Pacific time here on Gen Con TV. Uh, now we're playing The Crown by formerly Feral Games. On Saturday, we have two streams of Saturday. We have the Isekai Realms at 11 a.m., where players are mysteriously transported to the Forgotten Realms in a thrilling su adventure supporting the Extra Life for Kids charity, followed by Chaos Agents, a new game by Richard Garfield, at 4 p.m. Pacific time. On Monday, Peter vs. the Machine, where I will continue my game as Sweden, pursuing a cultural victory, um after losing my capital can you believe i lost my capital oh my gosh uh, yeah i don't know that i have any chance of winning this game but i am not going to give up we're going to try it uh then dress the quest at 6 p.m pacific time tuesday indie by night the hunted at 7 p.m pacific time on wednesday you know we have our amazing miniatures painting show called path of the brush which is at 4 p.m pacific with rick ankeny this episode, uh, Rick always has a special guest on the show. This uh, this coming episode, the special guest is me, where I will pretend to be a miniatures painting painter. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I'm going to paint board game pieces. I think that's my plan. <laughs> uh, and then at 6 p.m. Pacific time, Wednesday evening, right after Path of the Brush is Actoroki. It's going to be movie night, where we are going to play a narrative film that inspired by, you know, this is what act rookie is. We play role-playing games and then we find a beat and we create a narrative film that is um, uh, a, a screenplay adaptation of a role-playing game moment. And we're, and so we did that back in May. We have now have the film edited. It's called Spa Day and it features uh, Mackenzie Wynn and Sarah Moore and Dylan Smith. And I think it's quite lovely. So I hope you'll come and watch it. And then on Thursday, we have Blood on the Clock Tower at 10 a.m. Pacific and Roll with Rim Alternus at 5 p.m. Pacific. And Friday at 2 p.m., we're back here for Table Takes. Thank you so much to the Gen Con TV crew, Marcus Mace, Steve Connard, Sarah Moore, Jim Slonikowski, and Tanel Lovett. Also, thank you to Princess Danny at Gen Con for you know giving us social media exposure. Uh-huh. And thanks to my delightful co-host, Javion Smith, Bonsai Baby and the Noir Enigma. Thanks to our guest, Tim Beach. Woohoo. And thanks thank most of all to all of you for watching and hanging out with us in chat. Remember, follow Gen Con TV. And what I mean is click the follow button, please, and tell your friends. And you know, Come hang out with us every you know every chance you get. We love to see you. Thank you. And come Goodbye. see us in two weeks for Gen Con. Yes. 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 <laughs>